All right. Welcome. Good morning. Buongiorno. Goedemorgen. Calimera. I can't, I don't know any others. Um, I probably, if I think about it, I could do a few more. My name is Martin Albarda. Um, I am the host here in the uh, Blue Room, or the Blue Stage, we should say. As you can see, we've lit it blue. Um, this is uh, going to be a venue that is going to be uh, used throughout um, today and tomorrow for a number of uh, very interesting sessions. Um, I work for a company called Flock Associates, which is the uh, first global marketing change management uh, consultancy. We have offices in the UK and in the US. Um, and um, I have a few technical and practical uh, pieces of information. So blue stage here, purple stage next door. So by the time you feel ready to uh, uh, switch gears, um, it is literally out the door to the right. And then on the other side here, we have um, the stage that we used during the, uh, the other sessions. So as you can see here, per, we're in the blue, we're right in the center of the event here. Um, complimentary Wi-Fi is uh, available here, uh, just as it is everywhere else. Um, the Wi-Fi network, FOMG15, password, all capitals, Rome 2015. That's probably the most unbreakable password we've seen um, to date. Um, really original, and nobody's going to figure that one out. Um, and there's also the hashtag FOMG15 uh, for you to use if you hear something interesting or something that you fundamentally disagree with. Um, so uh, share uh, the love. Um, the first session uh, today is uh, going to be um, uh, taking place now. It's going to be uh, by a company called Effective, um, spelled TV, but it is Effective. Um, they are uh, an audience technology company, and if you want to learn about how to connect with relevant audiences at scale in real time, then this is your session. Um, and I would like to welcome Effective uh, to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Glenn Calvert. I'm the founder and CEO of Effective. Effective is a programmatic media and technology company. We're very much focused on how we can use data for prediction of the right people to target, but also to use the data for increasing the creative and the relevance of the creative that we serve to people. I'll be joined on stage very soon by Christian, who is the GM for digital marketing for the TUI group, the TUI Travel Group, and we'll be talking about how uh, we've been working together. So, what we're discussing today is this challenge. How do we evolve the programmatic space or the media space in general to actually be interesting and relevant for consumers? So how do we actually get to true one-on-one -on -one personalized marketing to people? So what we serve them is actually relevant, informative, and interesting, and not goes unnoticed. That's the, uh, the topic or the challenge that we're going to be talking about today. I think as an industry, we focus a lot on what programmatic, we talk a lot about programmatic and the benefits to it and the efficiency it's created. I think we're very honest with ourselves. It's good for us. It's maybe not so great for the consumers. The consumers haven't actually seen any value come out of this just yet because we're still trading in inventory and creative that is the same standard mobile or display um, ads. So how do we genuinely move this forward for consumers and serve something more, more relevant, more interesting? So let's look first of all at personalization that consumers are used to and are very comfortable with because it adds genuine value to them. When a user tells you exactly what they're interested in, when they ex explicitly ex show you what they want, so usually via search, or they go to a client's website and fill in information, um, or they are uh, sign up for an email. You're able to personalize your communications to that user. You can serve personalized PPC ads to them. You can do personalized retargeting once they've left your website. You can serve them with personalized email addresses. What do you do, though, when intent is not known? So we want to do personalization, and, and at the top here, where it is shown, users and people think it adds a lot of value to them. But we don't do a good job down here when we don't explicitly know what they're interested in. So what does personalization look at this level? And that's what we're going to discuss uh, today. Personalization to audiences or to people is a talking point. So how personal can you go? What actually should it look like? I think very much it's a generational mindset that everyone in this room is used to being always on, always connected, and sees the value in being connected and having personal measures served to us. 
Um, and therefore, how do we actually translate this into um, pre-targeting or pre-awareness? So if we assume that consumers and us in this room are open and want to see personalized creative, want to see messaging, marketing, communication that actually adds value to us, then, then the next assumption is, well, how do you actually technically do that? And we're, for the very first time in our industry, able to specifically do this. And the reason being is the silos have all been joined together. So what you know about your audience inside your CRM, or what you do inside your, your search platform, or what you do inside your email platform, historically they've always been siloed, and they were very much separate to each other. And then on the media delivery, on the marketing communications, they were separate channels as well, either ad servers you were using or publishers you were working with. And for the very first time in our industry, the silos are now fully connected. So the single view of the user can be seen from the start, from before they visit your website, to what they do on your website, to what they leave your website. So now that you can join the dots and the silos have, have come together. This enables us to be able to do personalization up and down the funnel and through the line. So what does personalization or predictive marketing or one-on-one -on -one marketing look like when it is very complex? So it used to be quite simple. It was demographic targeting, contextual targeting, and it was audience-based. And now we're talking about individuals, we're talking about single people, we're talking about personas. And each one of these is very, very different. Every single person here will obviously be knowing this is very obvious. How do we make, how do we add value to the consumer? How does the brand fulfill the need of the consumer? That's ultimately what the, the, the answer has to be. So if you are going to get consumers to choose your brand or the brand that you represent, what are you going to offer that individual to choose your brand over someone else? When every single persona or person has very specific needs. So in the travel sector, for example, there are different personas that we can be reaching. And each of these personas have very different views on what resonates with them, what influences them. Couples, for example, heavy on reading reviews to find the best tourist attractions. Young groups, for example, heavy in social endorsement and social activity to plan where to go. Very price sensitive. And the business travelers, very last minute and very quality conscious. Every single one of these has a different need. And so as a single brand, how do you personalize your marketing to these individuals to get the response that you require? So from a technical standpoint, from a delivery standpoint, how do we actually start to join the dots? And this, I think, will be the, the, the big area we see in our programmatic space in the coming years, is the combination, what's been very separate up until now, but the combination of coming together of media optimization with creative optimization. Everything we talk about in programmatic currently is how we use data for targeting and how it doesn't come to life in the creative. So right at the start, when I showed you, when the user shows you intent, you can personalize a PPC ad or a personalized retargeted ad to them. We don't do that at the top of the funnel. So how do we use that data at the top of the funnel to actually do a personalize, to, to actually offer personalization and more, uh, and more value for the consumer? So it really is combining the who and the what. The who being the media optimization and the what being the creative optimization. So instead of now determining for, for your brand or as an agency for the brand you're working with, what data I use to determine who I target. Maybe it's the websites they go to. Maybe it's the social platforms they're on. Uh, maybe it's the content they're sharing. Are they an existing customer or not an existing customer? The device they're on. We use these data points to determine who we serve an advert to, but we can use all these data points to bring it into the creative as well. So every single unique user gets a fully personal message served to them. If you know a user is heavy into reading reviews to plan their holiday, then why are you not bringing review content into the, all the the marketing comms that you serve to that user. If you know that someone is planning their travel in social environments, then why are you not bringing social endorsement into the creator that you're serving? So the level of personalization has to increase to get influence and influence that particular user. Um, I'll come at the end of this uh, session to some examples of what we've done. But before I do, uh, I want to just bring up the point around what I'm talking about. I'm discussing here how we can, at scale, deliver personalized messages to individuals, true one-on-one -on -one marketing, marketing communication. And when you discuss this with people, it's always the same talking point of, well, what does this say for creativity? 
And what does it say for the people in this room and the jobs that we have? You know, are we going to be out of a job? And I actually think it's, it's pretty much the opposite. That what we've seen and what we're seeing in this, in this space is that the data that we can leverage and the machines we can use to leverage that data give us the tools we need to be exceptionally creative. So this example here is by looking at the Thompson brand and looking at the users that go through to that, to that, to that uh, website and saying, what do they do? They, they exhibit all of the signals you'd expect them to exhibit. You can see, I think this might be working. Yeah. So Paris here, holidays, tourism spots, all inclusive, the brand name, all keywords and content that we see that user being interested in. But what we also see from this same user is Boots, Mother Care, L'Oreal, Vitamins. So what we can see, because of the technology, is a lot of interesting insights about the audience that we want to actually target. So here, you have single mums at home, at home with the children, planning where to go on holiday, but also browsing content that would exhibit them to be uh, a mum. And in the evening time, the conversion happens on a different device in the same household. So, interesting insights that would not have come out otherwise from the technology being able to pro provide this to us, but really having analysts, account planners on the data to, uh, to explain what it means. So, in a minute, I'm going to come on to some examples of how Thompson are using technology like this to deliver a more personalized story. Um, but before I do, I'd like to introduce Christian to the stage, who's going to come from the brand's perspective and explain how, as a brand, they need to be thinking about what technology they need to have and how they've got to actually strategize and plan in this particular world. Thank you. Cheers, I'll grab that off it. Thank you. Okay, so as uh, Glenn says, I am the uh, general manager for digital paid marketing for TUI Group in the UK. So that uh, means I look after display, paid search, and affiliates marketing for the Thompson and First Choice brands. So I'm going to talk you through some of the challenges that we see in digital marketing, in increasing personalization, some of the technology and initiatives that we are working through. So life used to be an awful lot simpler for us as a traditional retail-based retail -based travel agent. People used to go down to their travel agent on the high street, book their two-week holiday in the sun in Spain for roughly, it used to be around 29 pounds. Uh, this was back in the day when you didn't have to wear a cone of shame for taking your kids out of school uh, out during term time. Um, but now the purchase funnel has changed fundamentally. People used to go from top to bottom quite quickly. Uh, but now they're much more likely to divert off or to go back up to the beginning as they expand or uh, reduce their um, selection list of destination and brands that they're interested in. Also much more likely to switch between devices as well. So a journey, research journey might start on a mobile, continuing to research and refining your choices on a tablet, and then finally make the book in on your desktop at home. And this pace of change is also accelerating. So with this sophistication comes a speeding up. So in terms of increased sophistication of the marketing technology that's there. So six months ago, what was shiny and new could well be out of date within six months. So this creates a fascinating challenge to keep up with it and to hopefully to stay ahead. And as a business, as we become more digitally focused, we adopt many of the processes of our IT departments, so things like agile development. So this continual improvement, iterative, always on approach is embedded within our marketing. We can't afford to rest on our laurels of good performance. And obviously, as everybody knows, there's a challenge to grab people's attention. Proliferation of devices, people are always on with media. The actual sheer volume of media consumption is growing, so it becomes ever more important for us to find new and more creative ways to stand out. And that means that how we talk to people and what we say to them is fundamentally changing as well. So not just within our brand marketing about how we engage and become more interesting, but also within our performance marketing, how we follow a user through the journey and we talk to them at different stages and follow up a brand and engagement message with something that's more orientated to what they're looking for in market now. And the more we know about them, the better we're able to serve ads that are more relevant, more interesting and more engaging. One of the challenges for us, and we see it, is that you know, our customers are a pretty eclectic bunch. They, you know, as 
they are very different, very varied in their interests and their tastes. But one thing we do generally see as a truth across everything that we do is people generally like to go on holiday with people who are like them. Um, we all come back from holidays and we've said there were too many kids there or there were too many old people or there were too many Germans or too many Russians or too many English people. Um, so everybody likes the reinforcement of going on a holiday and seeing people that they get on with um, on the holiday with them. So for that reason over the years, Tui has built a very uh, well-defined and segmented range of products uh, that appeal to many different holiday choices. So whether it be the Sensatory, which is four five-star upmarket hotels uh, for couples and kids, uh, Sensamar, which is our couples only, so no kids allowed, uh, Gold for the over 50, 60 audience, and then seen our youth brand. So the key for us is to develop the right products and then get them in front of the right person at the right time. However, one of the challenges that we face is that we don't yet have a universal uh, registration or login for our site until you've actually booked a holiday. So that means that up to 90% of site visitors at any one time can actually be anonymous to us. So this is where we need more information and signals and use technology to understand and find out more about them before they come to the site. That allows us to tailor their on-site experience and really drive up our performance conversion. So if we know more about them, what they've been interested in, what type of person they are, what holidays they've been on before, then we can start to serve more contextually relevant uh, advertising and on-site experiences. So we as a client, we will use technology, we'll use our internal data, so we'll use a DMP. Uh, we will use CRM data that feeding into Facebook custom audiences. Uh, we'll use retail data, online marketing data, to again, to drive more insights and more information. And we'll also work with our media agencies and our media partners in order to leverage the th access to the third party data as well. And this helps to fuel creative, dynamic optimization. So we'll have a decision tree like this that's served through our ad serving technology. And again, we can take those signals that are being fueled through from Effective and many of the brands we work with, and we can serve a contextually relevant ad based on what they're interested in, what they've been researching, some of the other signals that we'll see. So for example, if someone's looking for a holiday to Ibiza and we know that they're aged 18 to 25, we can serve them a scene ad. If we know they're 55, it's gold. If they've got families, we can serve them a holiday village ad. And again, click-through rates, conversion rates, we've seen much improved. Another brief example here in terms of trying to be more creative with our creative. Uh, so we've done a lot of work with creating dynamic weather feeds. Uh, so if someone's in Manchester and it's dropping it down with rain, we can serve them ads that can counterbalance that with where we know they are searching for holidays. And we can typically see 20, 30% improvements in our click-through rates and, and performance. One last thing before I hand back to Glenn is around attribution. So obviously we are increasingly using attribution to drive the value of our marketing. Um, we are, like many businesses, moving away from a last paid click model towards an algorithmic approach. And that's driven as fantastic value in understanding better the truer picture of what display and prospecting plays in the path to conversion. We can much get, get a much better view around engagement, uh, time on site, and the influence it had on making a book in that otherwise channels, uh, whether it be paid search or affiliates, might often steal all the credit for. And that, I'll just hand you back over to Glenn. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. So, what we have with Thompson here, as an example, is the ability for brands to now, with the technology, in real time, to match any of their product catalog to users showing any intent for that product online, on the internet, on any device. So in this example here, you get broad signals from a user that they are in, in market for travel. Just a point that they haven't actually been to a brand yet. They haven't, sh they haven't explicitly gone to a client's website and interacted with it yet. They are broadly showing signals that they are in market for travel. And there's a Forrester report that says 60 to 90% of a consumer's decision-making process is done prior to actually hitting a client's website first. So the importance of the predictive element is, ver is, uh, is critical. So here, light signals of in market for travel, we can serve them uh, Thompson adverts. The minute we see any signals around a particular location, it can be matched instantly to the client's uh, available products. We can bring in, if you're looking like you're going to Crete, we'll bring in 
the latest uh, f uh, package holidays for Crete with the latest prices. And then throughout the day, in real time, as that person's signals are changing, the creator they're change is, is changed as well. And this is the, what brands need to be thinking about. How do I actually make the adverts I'm serving to that person native to their experience? So that individual has an individual uh, problem or solution they're looking for. And how does each, each brand then personalize that story to them? That particular example you saw there end up with uh, between nine different uh, uh, travel locations served to different uh, consumers, uh, f over 500 more lands per day against standard creative, 21% uh, increase in CTR, uh, and 70% increase in, in conversion, just from activating that sort of level of personalization. So some final thoughts on, on this subject. It's pretty clear and pretty obvious that to get to, to make digital advertising relevant to the consumer, we have to be doing a lot more work and actually thinking, how do I actually solve uh, the problem that consumers face? How do I actually add value to the, to the consumer and not so much focused on how us as an industry are trading this, uh, this media? I think there's two takeaway thoughts around what predictive marketing and this technology can enable. One is what we heard a lot about earlier on, which is storytelling. So every single potential customer for a particular brand will respond to specific signals. Maybe it is the products they're in market for. Maybe it's the reviews they're, they're looking at. Maybe it's the location they're in or who their friends are. But every single potential customer has specific signals that will work for them. So this sort of technology, what we can do with programmatic now, means that the storytelling ability for brands is, is exponential. And second, from the marketeer side, is to follow the data. So everything we're talking about here, everything we're discussing, is based on data. It's based on knowing what specifically works for a, for, for a brand and what's going to drive uh, conversions. So when marketers are thinking about what's the technology stack to use, how do I activate this? How do I actually enable this sort of level of targeting to occur? How do that brand leverage their data? And how do they actually get uh, partnerships with guys who have interesting data as well? And that is that. Thank you very much. <clears throat> We can take some questions, I think. Yes. I was going to um, suggest any questions, and uh, maybe um, both speakers can uh, join us uh, on the stage uh, to see if there are any questions. Um, I just saw a, a tweet um, that said um, uh, the industry is explaining programmatic to the industry. Um, but I think, the, given that this space is still so new and so uh, dynamic and, and in flux, there, I think there, there remains a need to explain um, uh, programmatic uh, to the industry uh, and, and also to those people that are maybe still a little bit struggling with it. Do you find that as well, that, that this is still something that leads to more questions and that, that people still haven't sort of really gotten their heads around? Or are you finding it that the conversation is getting easier? I think the conversation is getting easier. And it's because we're moving away from talking about black boxes and algorithms and programmatic being a very new thing which with lots of uh, technical jargon around it. And you can actually start to think how a brand can use the technology to actually <laughs> add value to one consumers, but solve their business needs. And I think that's when you start to see levels of personalization coming through, it's a good example of how the tech can be leveraged and can be used um, to solve business problems. And within any of this, we don't need to talk about algorithms. We don't need to go into lookalike modeling. We don't need to discuss the, the servers used on the DMP. It's just how do I match this consumer, what's going to work for them. And the piping, the architecture that enables it to happen, happens to be programmatic. But we don't have to go into detail about it. And same question to you. Was yeah. it a tough sell or was it an easy process to sort of go down this path and, and implement this as part of your, your everyday marketing uh, process? Uh, I don't think it was a difficult process to start doing programmatic. I think you have to, for us, we started small and just showed the results that came through from it, I think. Uh, so I think the understanding of programmatic is well known within our, within our business, but it tends to be siloed. And I think many organizers will find this, that once you start to try and creep out beyond the pure media buying of programmatic and start to develop your marketing technology stack, that it enables, that's when you got into a lot of different and interesting conversations with whether it be procurement or you know, outside of marketing as to why I need to do this and why I need to spend this to get set up in order to be able to reap the benefit of it. Right. Is it a media budget or is it a marketing budget or is it a sales budget? Where does the budget come from now that it basically drives business uh, yeah. in the end? 
so our media budget or media marketing budget comes from the sales, so we have a cost of sale. So it's a, it's a cost within our overall operations. So therefore, the more we can drive, then the more kind of we can spend to do that. Right. I guess we don't have a fix. If we can keep driving it through, then the business is willing to invest in it. My final question before I turn it over to the uh, audience here is, in terms of keeping uh, sort of the, uh, making sure that the ads appear on the straight and narrow, so to yeah. speak, there's a lot of talk about, there's, there's a lot of uh, crap out there and there's a lot of uh, 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 people that take advantage of that and, and so on and so forth. And I'd like to hear from both of you actually on, on sort of what, what have you done in order to sort of keep it, um, uh, keep it productive and keep it clean and keep it on, in, in the right places and make it work. Sure. I think it's a combination of um, two things. So one is the everyone in the uh, in the industry. So from the entire value chain, from the brand all the way through to the publisher and all the tech providers in the middle, um, having to focus on this and talk about it. And second is how we would then solve the problem. And it comes from two ways. One is operational. So just being diligent in actually how you are trafficking and buying your media. And second is technological. So that is using third parties that are specifically. Um, built to handle brand safety and viewability, um, but then also having your own piece of technology that, that you can even build on top of that and in, enhance that. And we know as an industry that, that no one's going to solve this overnight and no one's going to be fully solve it, but I think we're collectively, by having it in the, the, the mind share of our, of our conversations, we're moving to a position that's probably quite good. And uh, how about, do you get phone calls from the CEO about, you know, where, where are we appearing and, and how, how, yeah. how worried should I be about it? Yes, I do occasionally, less often than I probably used to. Uh, I think, we again, as, as Glenn says, we're using technology, so ad safe, ad blocking technology. Um, and there's two parts, I guess. One is around ad fraud or um, poor quality traffic, and then the other one is around the viewability side of it. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll use the technology, and again, it comes back to that agile approach. I think we're constantly trying to improve our um, the viewability standards that we have, and we go for a minimum standard, and then we just keep trying to push that and nudge that up. And then we'll use the technology that enables us to block, or at least minimize as much as possible, what you might call any fraudulent or completely unseen traffic. Um, I think sometimes it becomes a challenge as the new technologies we talked about, new me media owners, new uh, platforms come through. So how do we enable that that maybe works on desktop into mobile or into video and get those same standards running through? Yeah. And do you, do you find that you, you need to keep a very close eye on it or, or can you be a little bit more relaxed now as an advertiser? I think you've got to keep a close eye on it. So um, I think it also goes through waves. So I think we have to be diligent about it. Um, and just keep trying to drive it forward and just improve it as much as possible. Okay, good. Um, the floor is yours uh, for the asking, so if anybody would like to ask a question to um, the speakers, then please do so now. We have a microphone which we would like to use right here, <laughs> over here. Yep, um, because that way we can capture the question also on video. <laughs> I was wondering if, uh, as you're um, optimizing and customizing creative, is there a point in diminishing returns in terms of how custom you get, uh, meaning um, it's not paying out and just from production or even from response? You know, how, how custom is custom is your, your finding in kind of this new ecosystem? Sure. So I think the first uh, part to answer that question is to say that if you look at just programmatic in general, I mean, if we're delivering uh, automated media, let's say it's display, but maybe social and video as well, and we're not doing anything to increase the level of personalization, then you're definitely optimizing to a level that you just can't go any further because the tool at your disposal is just not going to just get the attention, you know, whether it's not in view or whether it is just the most amazing title you could possibly imagine, but the creator just doesn't resonate at that point of time. So I think that's why, as an industry, we'll see more of the data coming to play in, in the creative, because you've reached a, a point of diminishing returns on just a purely the algorithmic targeting approach. Then, when it gets to what we put in the creative, well, we're just starting out, and this is the exciting period. Like, what, what exactly will it be in the creative that resonates with different people at different points of the funnel for different brands and different verticals? So we see that if you're bringing location data into the creative for some brands, telling a user how many people in their area are buying that or choosing that brand, it works very well, and not so well for other brands. Bringing in products-led uh, content to, for um, some clients works exceptionally well compared to others, maybe because they've got more products to, to, to deliver. So I think from in terms of the, 
the level on the creative side, we're really just starting out, and that's going to be the exciting period. But I think on the, the media optimization, absolutely, there's going to be a level of how good you can get because of the amount of data at your disposal and where you can reach those consumers. So the level of personalization just gives you the advantage effectively. Any other questions? We have about two minutes left. Um, I have a question for you, um, for both of you. Uh, five years from now, all media traded programmatic through the programmatic platform? So, um, yes and no. <laughs> okay. So, yes as in, of course, because it's efficient for, for procurement and for tracking and for optimization. Um, and no, because we don't know in five years what media opportunities there will be for brands to interact with consumers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a few years back, no one would be envisaging what you have with Uber, for example. And we won't envision in five years' time what will be the next thing, how the internet is, is leveraged and used. And therefore, I think that we won't know the opportunity to get creative in front of people. And maybe it won't even be adverts anymore, it's going to be more content. So, yes and no. Okay. Well, maybe I should rephrase it for you then. All current media uh, in five years traded programmatic or not? Uh, I think the vast majority of what I call the performance media that we do, so whether it be primary display, I think the vast majority of that will be programmatic as more people adopt, get used to it, see the benefits of it. I think there will always still be a place for more premium or site-specific activity that maybe isn't quite either scaled up to do or it requires a greater level of involvement and kind of planning at that point to buy partnership activity. But I think the vast majority of the volume of it will probably be traded programmatically. Okay, excellent. Uh, bang on time. Glenn Calford, Christian Armand, thank you very much. And um, we are going to get ready for the next session. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you.